Hi, so in this video we're going to be looking at deriving the AK model and this comes about when we start to think about learning by doing in our long run economic growth models. So learning by doing was developed by Roma 1989 and in this paper and the idea is that we have some sort of learning by doing as, as by name and this is where workers accumulate knowledge and they improve their skills during production of a good. And so what we can have is then we have externalities from production from individual firms and this will generate technological progress at the aggregates level. So we have individual firms producing, they're just taking their production as given as usual, but they generate some sort of externality which then which these in increase in knowledge and these increase in skills will then spill over and all the other firms in the economy will benefit from the knowledge gained by this one firm and we have an external externality and so at the aggregate level we can have increasing returns to scale I'm not sure quite why I drew that arrow there but hey -oh. and that's the thought process behind learning by doing and we then endogenize the growth of technology in the model because this is giving some explanation of technology in the model through this spillover of knowledge and so we have an endogenous growth model and we'll see why this then becomes the AK model as I start to derive this learning by doing model. So we can begin with an individual firm's production function so the output of firm I is given by YI and they have this production function which depends on this sort of productivity or technology parameter A bar and it also depends on their inputs to production in capital and labor. These are indexed by I because they're the inputs for firm I and we're going to assume that we have lots of identical price taking firms so they're just going to take prices as given and the inputs to factors of production are paid their marginal products and so on and because these are identical firms we're going to have a symmetric equilibrium so every firm is making the same decisions about how many workers to employ how much capital to employ and thus how much to produce so from the fact that we have a symmetric equilibrium we can then write our aggregate output so it's not indexed by i it's just the output of the whole economy which is equal to n and here we're going to say that n is just the, the number of firms in this economy, number of firms. So our aggregate output is just the number of firms multiplied by the output of an individual firm, because every firm is producing the same, so we can do this. And so this is equal to A bar multiplied by uh, the capital stock and labor, which are raised to the power of their marginal share of income. And so this is just the individual production function, but it, we've aggregated it because we have a symmetric equilibrium. So the endogenous growth part of this is going, or the learning by doing part, is going to come from this um, A bar and how we represent the parameter A bar. And this isn't just going to be a constant parameter or one that's governed by a constant growth rate as in the solo model we're going to define a bar to be equal to a a technology parameter multiplied by k over l to the power of mu and so what we'll notice is that we as we increase our capital stock and we increase sort of our production or whatever we are going to potentially be increasing our um, a bar and so we have some learning by doing where our productivity or our technology is going to depend on our factors of production. And so we can actually have increasing returns to scale at the aggregate level of this, because if we notice that we are using in this A bar sort of formula, K and L at the aggregate level, these aren't indexed by the letter I. So each firm is just going to take this as a given. A, a firm can choose KI and LI but these do not come into A bar so a, an individual firm choosing their inputs is not going to affect the aggregate level of productivity but in the aggregate these these decisions by these small identical firms are going to potentially offer increasing returns to scale of production 
So let's substitute this a bar into our production function and we get this equation here that I've already written out. And then we can notice that we have two k's here and we can and we have two l's here. So we can sort of just simplify this expression and collect these like terms and we get that our production y is equal to our parameter a multiplied by the capital stock to the power alpha plus mu and then the labor stock to the power of 1 minus alpha plus minus mu. So these powers still sum to 1, we're still fine and we still have this neoclassical production function. And what we can further do is get our output per worker, which is just equal to our aggregate y over l. And if we divide by l, well, we just get rid of this 1 on this labor aggregate labor uh, variable. And so we can just rearrange this to be equal to k over l to the alpha plus mu. And k over l is equal to our lowercase k, our capital per worker or per capita. So now that we've got this, we can start to derive or start to think about our steady states and our balanced growth paths of this economy. And what we're going to use for this is just our standard capital accumulation formula that we should be familiar with from the solar growth model and that the change in the capital stock is just equal to our investment minus our depreciation. I won't explain this in detail. And what we have done is we have in a previous video, we have changed this into a per capita value. And we do this by dividing through by L, as I've done on this line. And But what we want to have is a per capita, so a lowercase k, as that evolves over time, whereas here we have the uppercase k evolving over time divided by L, so these two things are different. So we can use, and we've done this in a previous video, we can use the fact that lowercase k dot is equal to k dot over L minus nk, and we, we've derived all this using derivatives and the quotient rule. So check out previous videos on the solar growth model for this, but I will just use the result in this video. I won't go over exactly how that was done again. And we get that k dot in per capita terms is equal to the savings rate multiplied by per capita output minus the depreciation rate plus the population growth rate multiplied by capital per capita. And above, we got this output per capita value. This is why we did it. So we can then substitute this in. And we substituted that in on this line of workings. And now that we've got the growth rate of capital per capita over time, we can find the growth rate of, of uh, capital or per capita capital. And so we do this by just dividing through the derivative of capital with respect to time by capital per capita and this is very simple just divide just dividing this term up here by lowercase k and we get this expression down below so what we can recall now is we as i just highlighted we we found this output per capita that was equal to a multiplied by our capital per capita to the power of alpha plus mu. And so now that we've got our growth rate of capital per capita, we can just use our growth rate rules. And it's, as we've done before, this is effectively just using rules of logs. And this, this looks like an R, but that should be a K there. And we'd use rules of logs to show that the growth rate of Y is equal to the growth rate of A plus alpha plus mu growth rate of k and the growth rate of a here is zero this was just a constant parameter that we had so to find the out the growth rate of output per capita we just use this equation and we can just substitute in our growth rate of capital per capita so now we've got our growth rate of output per capita and our growth rate of capital per capita and what we'd essentially what we want to do next is to use these to find where we have a balanced growth path 
which would be where these two variables, as well as the wage rate and the rental rate of capital and consumption, grow at a constant rate. And we can do this using the method I outlined in the video on balanced growth paths. And um, but what I'll do here is just just mention what what happens when we when we look at deriving these balanced growth paths. And because I went that was quite a lot of working to derive it. But what when we look for balanced growth paths, what we see is we only actually have a balanced growth path. It, well, this isn't technically true. We only have a balanced growth path with positive growth rates of capital and output if we have this condition holding, if we have alpha plus mu is equal to one. We could, on the other hand, have, say, alpha, oops, my pen's not working very well. We could have alpha plus mu less than one, and in this case, we would have a balanced growth path, but we would have to have that the growth rate of output is equal to zero, and the growth rate of capital is equal to zero. So that is that is a possible balanced growth path, but it's, it's not necessarily what we're very interested in because this is just very similar to the solo model. And in reality, we don't observe that these things are constant, we do observe that they grow. So if we're looking for something with our output per capita growing at a positive rate and we want a balanced growth path, the only time we're going to have this is when alpha plus mu is equal to one, if we go through all this working to find a balanced growth path for these variables. And in in this case, if we if we look at our equations, well, if alpha plus mu is equal to one, well, this is gonna be equal to one. This alpha plus mu minus one power is just going to become zero. So this term just becomes one and drops out as well. And so we're going to have that the growth rate of capital is equal to the growth rate of output per capita, and it's equal to this savings rate multiplied by our A parameter minus and our sort of depreciation term or depreciation plus growth rates, uh, delta plus n. And th this is where we where we get the AK model from, because if we remember, this is, and I've just written it down here, th this is what our um, production function in the aggregate actually was in this model, where we were just generalizing using alpha and mu here. And but now we've said that we want to have alpha plus mu is equal to one, and this is equal to one. And so if we plug in alpha plus mu equal to one, well we get y is equal to a k to the one multiplied by l to the zero, and l to the zero is obviously one. So we get our production function is y equals a k. Hence why it's called the AK model, because our production function is just AK. So that's where this model comes from. And so by having a production function of AK and having these uh, learning by doing effects and knowledge spillovers from this, we have endogenous growth in the model. And we have that policy can have a long run effect on growth. If we look back at our long run growth here, we have that growth depends on this savings rate, which we tend to think can be affected by the government. We've seen this when we were looking at getting to the golden rule steady state in the solo model, that a government can change the savings rate in economy by say incentivizing savings, by changing certain taxes on savings and so on. And so if a government was to increase the savings rate, it would increase the growth rate of output per capita. And so we, we maybe like this endogenous growth model better than the solo model because it gives us this opportunity for policy to actually matter, which is what we observe in reality. There is, of course, a big issue with this model is in that it, rep it requires this alpha plus mu to be equal to one, uh, which might be called the knife edge parameter assumption or Will, will alpha plus mu really be equal to one in reality? It's a very specific rule we're looking for, but I, I won't discuss what, what this actually means because that's potentially a topic for another video and a lot of dis debate has gone into this and this could even be an essay title on its own. But yeah, this is why we have the AK model. It's a very simple model, so we can't criticize it too much. It just starts to get us in the direction of endogenous growth models where if we make this assumption, 
that we have this production function, we can have increasing returns to scale at the aggregate level and have some endogenous growth in our model. So that will just about wrap up this video. Please do leave a like if it was at all useful. Subscribe for a bit of economics in your subscription feed and check out the playlist for future videos on endogenous growth.